you for joining us at the 2020 Florida Artificial Reefs Summit. I know it's been a long time since this was originally planned in April, but we are so glad that you can join us here again today. It is the first conference perhaps that was canceled on our end from Florida Sea Grant. And I just want to give kudos to Keith Milley with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and Angela Collins with Florida Sea Grant that instead of delaying it, decided to push ahead because we've been able to expand our audiences to a broader scope of participants than we might have had otherwise. And as a new director to Sea Grant, this was the first event that for me was canceled, but it was also the first one that I got to put a little thought into it. And at the time, I was struck really by the scope and diversity of participants. So when we think of conferences, a lot of times they might have a singular focus on fisheries or the environment or ecosystem services, but artificial reefs turn into much more than what their name implies. I actually think it's almost a little bit counterintuitive because artificial reefs become natural reefs they are genuine, they are real, they support biodiversity and a variety of other functions that both our natural systems and our human systems value. So I want to give a shout out to everybody that's here because you are here and you are able to contribute through your work to a broader array of potential solutions and improvements to these systems. And it will be exciting to see how the, these stakeholders, both public and private, industry and academic and agency-wise are here. And I just wanna give a big shout out to everybody who's participating. I encourage you to, even though you don't have the interactions in the break room, you do have an opportunity to get a much deeper understanding of the science that you'll hear about and the policymakers. And again, as you contribute to the success of both the natural systems and the human systems that are involved in this, thank you for participating and I hope you have a great couple of days here. Welcome to the 2020 Florida Artificial Reef Summit. My name is Angela Collins and I am with the University of Florida IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant. The 2020 Florida Artificial Reef Summit is virtual for the first time ever and now on a screen near you. Good morning, everyone. And my name is Keith Milley. I am with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Division of Marine Fisheries Management artificial reef program. First, we would like to thank all of you for still being here. We are so glad that you're still here with us as we've pivoted a couple of times to bring the 2020 summit to you. And the theme of this year's summit is bringing Florida's artificial reefs into focus. Clearly, there's many ways that we that we do that and we think back in time and we're very pleased that the, the program reflects some of the contemplation of the, the past, the history of artificial reefs and switching to this virtual environment has uh, resulted in um, us focusing more and especially our speakers of which we, we thank for uh, evaluating their talks and, and focusing down on only the most important information and condensing it in order to meet this virtual format. Yeah, absolutely. Our poor speakers had to really focus in and pick out the most important 10 minutes from their talks so that we could condense it into this virtual program. So for that, we are so thankful. And we'd also really like to thank our sponsors who have continued to stick with us um, and support the virtual summit even after the transition from the live event into the virtual format. So thank you very much to our sponsors. We hope that you check all of them out in the exhibit hall and in the sponsor portal. There are multiple places to interact with the um, sponsors um, and their exhibit booths in the exhibit hall. And we also thank 
our keynote and special session speakers, Drs. Bill Lindbergh, Hayward Matthews, and Jim Bonsack. Together, these three gentlemen represent over a century and a half of artificial reef experience in the state of Florida. For that, we are, uh, we are extremely grateful and we look forward to the words of wisdom that these uh, gentlemen will be sharing with us throughout the summit. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so many, so much expertise in this program. Um, we would also like to thank all of you for continuing to stick with us and for, um, you know, staying afloat in the deluge of emails related to the Florida Artificial Reef Summit, um, all versions of it. So thank you for reading your email and for clicking in and joining us today. And we also want to remind you about the, uh, the, the platform we're using, this feed loop software. There's a lot of tools in here to make it interactive. I think that's one of the things that we are missing the most, not being together. So we encourage everyone to use the, uh, find the networking tool, use the chat box, communicate with each other, communicate with the speakers, communicate with us, let us know your questions and, and uh, please exchange that information and uh, uh, if you have any if, uh, points at which you're, you're stumbling and don't know where to click or which button to push, uh, please visit the, uh, the nice video that Angela put together. You will find that in the help tab um, or in the email that she sent uh, yesterday. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to navigating around this, this new platform uh, together with you these next three days. Yes, yes, absolutely. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have problems navigating the virtual event. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to sort of conclude with a huge shout out to our steering committee. Um, these guys signed up for a steering committee um, and they've actually been on almost two years of telephone calls to discuss summit preparations and plannings. So um, we're going to go ahead and just, you know, give these guys a huge shout out. Uh, Victor Blanco with UF IFAS and Florida Sea Grant, Ed Camp with the University of Florida, James Gray with the Sebastian Inlet District, Brittany Hall Scharf with UF and Florida Sea Grant, Leslie Haynes with Lee County, Scott Jackson with UF and Florida Sea Grant, Sean Keenan with FWC, and um, Christine Kittle also with FWC, Robert Turpin with Escambia County, Anna Zangrones with UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant, um, and also uh, Sean Fitzgerald with FWC and Jeffrey Renchen also with FWC. These guys were hugely implemental in putting together first the, um, the, the summit agenda and now the virtual platform. So thank you, huge shout out to all of our steering committee members, um, past and present. And um, hopefully we won't have to tap them into any more steering committee meetings for a little while. And the, the screens you see uh, behind us really represent the world that we've been living in, obviously, these past uh, six months. But th this is the, the environment that we use to create the virtual uh, experience that you will have. And uh, we are also, in addition to the steering committee, we also appreciate all of our speakers who took extra time out of their schedules to pre-record with us, and in some cases, re-record. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we appreciate that. Folks were calling in from all around the state of Florida, all around the country. And in, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll point out the, the, the black uh, <laughs> the box behind uh, Angela for R.K. Turpin. That's Robert Turpin, who often he would be connecting to us from offshore during uh, oversight of the uh, Pensacola Bay Bridge artificial reef deployments. So uh, we're very I'm grateful to have this technology that has brought us to this point, and we're very excited to uh, to roll out to roll out this program with for you today. All right, thanks guys for being here, and we'll see you in the live session. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Since we are in live session now, uh, we just want to take a, a quick moment to uh, introduce our moderator since this is the first session 
of the summit. My name is Keith Milling again with the FWC and my co-moderator this morning, Anna. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Keith. I'm Anna Sangronis with UFIFIS Extension and Florida Sea Grant. So Anna and I will be working uh, behind the scenes as things are playing, as well as a number of other members of our steering committee. And, and we, wanted to, uh, we are going to be um, going directly into the Hindsight is 2020 session. And uh, we encourage everyone to ask questions during the chat. We have the presenters online with us right now as we speak, Hayward and Jim. We will be going live with them after the, uh, the presentations conclude. So uh, this session, it will last 30 minutes. So during the 30 minutes, as you're listening to the talks, write down your questions, type in the questions, and then we're gonna come back live with uh, Hayward and Jim and answer your questions. So with that, we can go live with the uh, hindsight is, is 2020. So uh, take it away. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Hayward Matthews. Hayward has been involved with Florida's artificial reefs uh, development for, uh, for decades, and he is connecting to us uh, today from his home in Clearwater. Welcome, Hayward. I guess I'm one of the old guys in the artificial reef community, having built my first artificial reef, my master's thesis at FSU in 1963. However, the first artificial reef built in Florida was actually in 1953. A group of St. Petersburg Beach Junior Chambermen, led by Wakeman Porter, made an artificial reef unit out of three old car tires with cement poured in the base, held together by steel rebar. With the help of a local marine construction firm, they pushed these tire units off a barge into the Gulf a few miles west of St. Petersburg Beach. When I started graduate school at FSU in 1963, my major professor was able to obtain a small grant from the Sport Fishing Institute to cover the cost of assembling four tire units, some of those used in 1953. These units did not have concrete ballast and were held together with poly rope. This two-year study measured the primary production of the algae growing on the tire units. It was surprising that the basic food production was comparable to a natural grass bed in Boca Ciega Bay. In 1965, Dallas County built two small artificial reefs in the Gulf using a concrete box unit called a pillbox from a Japanese design. These concrete units are still part of the Clearwater Artificial Reef where I've been conducting studies for over the last 50 years. In 1972, working with the city of Clearwater, we received a $48,200 grant from the Florida Park Service to start a two-year reef building program using a four-tire unit similar to my thesis unit. For this grant, we built a pneumatic punch that cut four two-inch holes in the tread of each tire to allow all the air to escape at deployment. Each tire had a 30 pound concrete ballast. Like the earlier St. Pete Beach Reef Project, we deployed these units using a small custom built outboard powered barge by hand using college students' labor, cheapest labor known. These original tire units were st are still on the site beside the old pillboxes deployed in 1965. Another artificial reef building material in the early days was old scrap car bodies. Alabama experimented with these only to find that they soon rusted away and sank into the sediment. We sank a scrap car body on the Clearwater Artificial Reef, but it quickly rusted away and sank into the sand bottom. In 1964, the city barge reverted to the Florida Park Service, so the Pinellas County Commission purchased a 68-foot diesel-powered barge and started the first full-time artificial reef building program in Florida. Once the county land people, field people learned about the setup of a new program, they stopped burying scrap tires. In 1965, the county purchased a tire splitter that would cut the tire in two halves. The halves could then be turned around, banded together in a 500 pound unit with plastic grappling similar to that used in South Florida. With the appearance of steel belted tires, the entire unit came apart and the tires scattered all over the sea floor. These have washed up on local beaches for many years since that time. After that disaster, the county program went to only concrete materials. In the mid-1970s, a group in Fort Lauderdale area began a project sponsored by Goodyear to make a reef unit with 10 to 15 compacted tires together held with plastic strapping. This unit seam came apart and over a million tires were scattered on top of local coral reefs. They are still working to remove those tires from that disaster. 
while scrap car tires have very long life in seawater and don't have any chemicals that leach out later in the ocean. However, their low density makes them unable, unstable on the seafloor over time without concrete ballast. Then in the 1970s, a private group of anglers in Jacksonville was building artificial reefs in the Atlantic using concrete culvert, but it never became a full-time operation. In 1976, I had a University of South Florida graduate student working on a master's degree thesis project that studied the economic impact of the Pinellas County artificial reef program. That study found the county program paid for itself four times over in economic impact during the first three years uh, after construction. Based on the success of the county reef program, I obtained a grant from Florida Sea Grant to form the Florida Sea Grant Artificial Reef Resource Team. This grant through St. Petersburg College allowed a five person team to travel around the state and provide technical assistance to local municipal groups starting their own artificial reef programs. The team worked with Sea Grant Marine Agents to provide site selection assistance and the biological work necessary for these groups to obtain the required state and Army Corps permit. This team provided hard assistance to group from Pensacola to the Keys and up to Fernandina Beach. Then in 1980, Exxon don donated a large oil drilling template to add to an artificial reef 35 miles off Apalachicola in the Florida Panhandle. This reef is 110 feet of water. Exxon covered the cost of transport and placement. Then in 1981, Dr. Dan Sheehy and I began work on an artificial reef unit designed by Asahi Chemical Corporation in Japan. The primary funding for this five-year study came from NOAA Fisheries. This unit is made out of fiberglass reinforced plastic, what they call FRP. This unique reef unit has provided very successful in Japan. The firm that built them donated these units in hope of creating a market for their product in this country. Two of these units were placed in 80 feet of water off Jacksonville and another two off Panama City. Later, another was deployed in 40 feet of water off Clearwater, but at that depth, they came apart. The FRP units proved to be very effective and could be deployed without cranes or barges. They never became that popular in the United States. In 1983, a group from Old Dominion University used a concrete dome reef unit off Virginia. This reef unit was similar to the concrete domes used by the offshore oil industry to cap an old oil well hole. These units were never very effective as fish attractants. Then in 1987, a total of 48 old railroad boxcars were donated by CSX Railroad for a reef off Sanibel Island. The doors were removed and square holes cut in each end for circulation. In a few years, all 48 boxcars collapsed from long period of wave action and were not effective after the steel remains sank into the sand. Then in 1993, a group in Sarasota built a reef unit they called a reef ball, similar to the domes used in Oak, Oak Virginia, but with a large hole with top. This unit had been used around the world, but with 500,000 in place at this time. Their construction utilized a rubber inflatable mold that can be set up on the shore and cement truck and pour in the concrete. A small reef can be deployed without barges or heavy equipment. However, without any rebar, reef balls can easily break up upon deployment and cannot be stacked by any vertical profile. Four groups of these reef balls were deployed off the Dallas County in 40 feet of water, but only attracted small grunts and pinfish. Then in 1998, Dallas County began planning for a new artificial reef 10 miles west of Dunedin Beach. I was retained as a consultant on this project and selected a site in 40 feet of water with a bare sand bottom. However, prior to the start of construction, we did a year-long study of a natural reef, a half mile northwest of the new reef site. This study found that the first few months after the new reef was deployed, there was a significant drop in game fish population on the natural reef. Many species appeared to have moved to the new artificial reef. However, by the end of the first year, fish population on the natural reef actually increased for many species. This increase we attribute to the reduction of fishing pressure, because most of the divers and anglers quickly moved or to the well-marked veteran reef. The design of veteran reef featured five different reef materials in popular use at that time. This reef had concrete culvert, three large steel barges, natural limestone boulders, a concrete unit called a polygon, and a unit built in Miami from leftover concrete called a tetrahedron. All five groups were placed in separate piles so we could determine which unit gave us the best attraction for the car. The piles of concrete culvert to be the most cost-effective as fish habitat. Studies on this reef confirmed what we had always known, and when sighted within the photic zone, artificial reef actually increased the production of carbon per square meter of sea floor. When first deployed, an artificial reef will concentrate food and game fish from surrounding natural reef areas. However, by the end of the first year, 
do the reduced fishing pressure, then the natural reefs have recovered their original amount. Then from 2001 to 2008, the Military Armored Vehicle Reef Project was funded by a grant to Dr. Sheehy and Aquabio Incorporated to deploy and study a variety of obsolete armored vehicles for reef construction. This funding was from the U.S. Defense Logistic Agency. Most of the vehicles deployed off Florida were M60 battle tanks. They were placed on permanent reef sites off Pensacola, Destin, Panama City, and others from Citrus County down to Sarasota. Two were dropped off Miami. These tank units were very stable and excellent fish habitat. Crickle became very popular dive sites. With 40 tons of heavy steel, these sank will provide fish habitat for many years. Then in 2006, the aircraft carrier Oriskany was sunk in 210 feet of water off Pensacola. This is the largest ship ever sunk for an artificial reef in the U.S. After extensive environmental studies, EPA determined that the PCB in the ship's wiring did not pose a threat to marine life. <laughs> Later studies showed some evidence that PC has shown up in small amounts in some of the fish. Florida also leads the country in ship sunk for artificial reef, with the Spiegel Grove off Key Largo, the Eagle off Isla Mirada, and the Vandenberg off Key West. And in 2012, the Mohawk was sunk off Sanibel and named Veterans Reef. All these ships have a great economic plus for the scuba charter boat community. In July of 2019, Pinellas County provided 50,000 startup funding for in addition to Veterans Reef with the deployment of 12 life-size concrete military statues, what we call the Circle of Heroes at Veterans Reef. This is the first underwater veteran memorial in the country that is designed and built especially for scuba divers. This reef has proved very popular with the local charter operation. Over 1,200 divers visited this memorial in the first four months after deployment. So which artificial reef material gives us the most bang for our bucks. After almost 60 years of building and doing research on artificial reef, it's my professional opinion that large piles of concrete material like coal provide the best fishing. With ships and large piles of concrete material, reefs should be placed at right angles to the prevailing current to provide an upwelling that concentrates plankton and attracts large schools of bait fish. Large ships and bar barge holes provide the best materials for attracting scuba divers, but their pre-drop preparation is expensive to avoid unwanted chemicals showing up in the fish. In conclusion, much of artificial reef history in Florida has been one of trial and error. Scrap tires, white goods, car body, railroad box tires, very, very poor reef material. Steel hull vessels provide large amounts of habitat, but dangerous materials must be removed prior to sinking. It's vital that the reef materials match the site in regard to sediment type, wave action, and other oceanographic conditions. Any questions? I'm honored to present Dr. Jim Bonsack. Jim is recently retired from the National Marine Fisheries Service, and he is connecting to us today from LJ, Georgia. Welcome, Jim, and uh, take it away. Yes, yeah, so um, my goal today is to provide a retrospective of Florida artificial reef science in the 70s and 80s, uh, the kind of the start of artificial reefs and about the time we're actually starting to experience overfishing issues and certainly in the 80s for sure. I'm a retired supervisory research biologist from, with the uh, National Marine Fishery Service. I'm now retired and live out of state. But um, anyway, so I hope I find, find this useful. Uh, so we all know how artificial reefs work. This is a picture of a ship that sank after a hurricane in the Virgin Islands. In eight hours, you know, it's very clean. A week later, you see algae growing on it and lots of fish around. And so this got my attention back uh, as a uh, student. And uh, I started a PhD dissertation working on artificial reef, which got me into this business. I was really interested in the science and ecology and I did research testing what was called island biogeographic theory using artificial reefs or natural reefs as islands in niche partitioning. Uh, this just shows an example of the reef I did. The first day we see about three fish on it. You can barely see one in the hole and two small grunt, but that's the day one of uh, my artificial reef. And a month later on the, on the right side of the screen, you can see it is uh, quite colonized uh, heavily uh, with lots of fish. And we compared, what we did, we compared the Great Barrier Reef, which has about 1,500 species with Florida Keys, which had at that time 389. I gather we added one, lionfish. Uh, but you see very similar uh, patterns of colonization in Australia. 
and the Florida Keys in terms of number of species, uh, mean number in the bottom and the total species on the top. In the lower, um, we have the uh, mean individuals per reef. And you can see very similar. Actually, despite all the more species they had in 1500, theoretically in the Great Barrier Reef, we actually had about the same number in Florida and the Great Barrier Reef. We're both at about the same latitude. I think I'm a degree uh, more north than they are south. But this showed you uh, the reef was the important thing and not necessarily how many species were in the area. Okay, there we go. So in the 1970s, the model really was literally, if you build it, they will come. And uh, about anything was used for uh, artificial reefs and uh, funding was scarce. Um, in fact, 1985, uh, I, I got hired by uh, National Fishery Service in 1984, 1985. They had $7 million worth of uh, grant awards. Um, and they decided that no funding would be made available for artificial reef research because we know they work. You know, you know what, could be, what could be a problem? So um, that was uh, kind of got me interested. Well, it turns out there are quite a few problems. I'll emphasize, you know, kind of what's going on. It's kind of the wild and woolly west in those days. Almost anything went. We had a, a group of, called the Reef Retirees that built artificial reefs. We had reefs built out of uh, discarded toilet um, casts that weren't done right. And we learned uh, quite quickly that uh, automobiles, buses, streetcars, airplanes, they don't make good artificial reefs. And here's an example from South Florida. There's a plane that uh, was torn apart by an anchor about three days after it was put down deployed, I guess is the word. And then we have a working Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce car um, made into an artificial reef. It lasted maybe about six months or a year. It didn't last very long. There's a story behind that. That was uh, uh, Broward County. They were bad because there was a big ship called the Mercedes that sank, or ran aground. It was sunk off uh, as an artificial reef off Fort Lauderdale in Broward County. So they wanted their own. They wanted to outdo Broward County. So they had their Mercedes out there and they had pictures of it. So it was a big promotion. Um, you know, everybody had a good time doing that, I'm sure. Um, we quite quickly learned the tires don't make very good reefs. And here's pictures of about 2 million tires or parts of that. They were deployed over 35 acres off Fort Lauderdale. There's, you can't see a fish in the picture. They do not make good reefs. Um, um, you know, fish just don't use them. Uh, algae don't even attach very well to them. So uh, those are one of the mistakes made early on. There are some others, actually studies of artificial reefs were kind of nice and they removed the reefs when they're done, but they're still figuring out how to get rid of these. And of course, and if you have area hurricanes, uh, they cause other problems because they move. They can damage damage, tear up seagrass and the corals or end up on your beach. And that's probably people here in North Carolina after Hurricane Bonnie probably didn't care much for the, the view uh, at that time. So these are some of the issues of not doing uh, good artificial reef planning and de deployment. So again, in Florida, we uh, face um, Hurricanes, about every five years, there's some hurricane. We've got a lot of them in uh, 04 and 05. Um, and so we've got to plan accordingly for those kind of conditions. This is the problem in Miami. This was a 250-foot Belzona barge that disappeared in the hurricane handle. They couldn't find it. They thought maybe it got buried. It was a big headline in the paper and turned out about a quarter of a mile away. Um, did a lot of damage as it dragged into our, and it's right in the middle of our artificial reef site at the time we did some work on. But this turned out to be a hazard for divers. The metal is jagged, they had big iron pieces were banging back and forth in the, in the swell, and they had to come out and cut those off, remove them. So those are another example of not doing good things with artificial reef. And here's a list of some of the damage of reefs out there. At that time, Broward County had about 40 ships and there were quite a few off of Miami. A lot of these were damaged, broken in half, they collapsed, uh, uh, they just didn't work one. Uh, Tentacle oil platform, for example, its legs uh, 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 lost legs, it fell over. So, um, you know, hurricanes and artifice reefs don't always work. We need to look at stability. Another example, this is a Boeing 727 deployed in 1983. There's a big deal called the Spirit of Miami. It's been about $100,000 taking this plane, to put it underwater, and they, they tied it down because the airplane that flies in the air, you know, a little bit of current, gets got a lift, wants to fly in the water. 
And what was happening is that um, vandals went out there and started taking off the shackles that was holding the thing down. And very quickly it disappeared and they didn't find it until about 17 later they found you, you 17 years later they found it in about 120 feet of water um, off Miami so uh, it didn't stay put and uh, here's a picture of the remains of that other things that didn't work here there's a water tower uh, again um, yeah a lot of our programs are uh, in in um, work, public works projects in Florida and the counties tend to run those projects so solid waste disposal is a legitimate use of artificial reefs, but you certainly don't want to do damage and make sense of it. So bridge rubble and things are used, and that was their primary mission, get rid of some of these things. And what do you do? Well, let's just put it in the ocean. I'm sure the pink dinosaur, 25-foot dinosaur, I never even saw that. I don't think it lasted. Uh, there's a Tenneco Reef Platform D that was moved from the Gulf of Mexico out here in 1992, and it didn't work terribly well. And then uh, Texco has a tax write-off. They had to replace all their uh, metal tanks with uh, plastic tanks because of salt water. So they decided to donate them for artificial reef material, but it never worked. So they have an artist's conception of uh, their tanks out there. But again, another failure. This is an extreme example. They actually they got the Air Force to to bomb them with 500-pound uh, bombs. They're actually concrete bombs. They didn't blow up, but they, they use it to sink the Dr. Melly here, and they use the bomb squad, uh, put out used uh, ordnance and uh, um, drug uh, chemicals that they had to blow up or burn up to get rid of them, so uh, they used it there. But one of the rules at the time was a artificial reef should be at least a quarter of a mile away from a natural reef. This is the Broward County uh, brochure in their program with the sunken Mercedes in the background. You barely see it. The diver, well, you can tell that's not a quarter of a mile away from the reef in the foreground. So uh, uh, there are mistakes made. Uh, and, and again, learn from the mistakes. Here's a couple other examples. A very large people grove in Key Largo, capsized and went down in the wrong place. Uh, most recently in 2015, uh, a capsized barge that put all these statues the artist made on top of the barge to take it out and sink the barge. As soon as they started putting water in it, capsized and rolled over. So again, you think uh, some, you know, you'd kind of avoid these kind of mistakes. And this is probably the worst thing. And for a while they were bombing and blowing these things up. But again, the bomb squad had a great time. And we found out very quickly that uh, this killed fish underneath. You know, I was an ordnance officer in the Navy and, uh, you know, explosions go very well underwater. And so we actually, uh, they sunk one near us uh, one day while we we're working on our project. And we said, let's go look at the debris. So we went out there and it's about, I have to wait an hour because they have to clear it, make sure all the ordnance is deployed and exploded. And then uh, we found the hull, but there's fish all over it. So that explosion not only killed everything around it, killed everything on the reef underneath it. So we, we kind of said, now maybe you should be doing this. Uh, plus it does structural damage to the ship. You don't need to do it. You can use scuttles. And, you know, and, and bring it down. But this is to get rid of derelict vessels in the Miami River that were using this. There's one in the lower left-hand corner, uh, sunken, that was a drug confiscated vessel. What do you do with those? Well, make them artificial reefs. So this is kind of the atmosphere at the time. There's a student at Nova University who was doing his research. He's figuring out how many fish were on, on these reefs. And you know, he had about 40 in Broward County. So I asked him, calculate how many reefs it would take to double the, the population of reef fish in Broward County compared to natural reefs. And so he did the calculation. It came over 10,000 ships would be necessary. And obviously, that's not going to get us very far economically or environmentally. So that's just, you know, just shows you what we learned there. And this is the most extreme example of the kind of things going wrong. Here's a company making hard drives for your computer, a little tiny thing about the size of, you know, a couple of packs of cigarettes. They had this advertisement. Uh, here's the picture of the Mercedes being sunk, uh, saying, send us your hard drives and we'll sink them, make an artificial reef out of IBM hard drives. And so several months later, here he is in the back of his yacht, the Megabyte, dumping boxes of hard drives. Now, I can guarantee you that's not a good artificial reef. And those uh, those things have chemicals. Um, they're not very, very, very environmentally friendly. And uh, this is just kind of the wild west gone wild. Fortunately, uh, science started getting, getting more interest. Uh, fortunately, again, uh, FWC and the Florida Sea Grant College Program got very interested in that, made that a theme. 
They had a, one of the big international meetings in Miami in 1987. We had about 349. Here's a picture of some of the participants. And Bill Seaman is in the front. And I can see Bill Lindbergh on there. And uh, my job was to make sure the publications were published in a peer-reviewed journal, which we did. But the take-home lessons from that meeting was science matters. We did, did need to do science. And uh, we should be doing no harm to the environment. So that kind of carried forth. There's another meeting a couple of years later. A big focus also, and that was one of my interests, was the uh, effect on fisheries. Uh, do they actually produce more fish or are they actually just attracting fish make, into one spot, making them easier to catch? And that was pretty important. Well, it turns out if you're overfishing, it's not a problem. Uh, you can build artificial reefs, it tracks, it doesn't make any difference, you're not overfishing. However, if you are overfishing, you're catching fish too fast or they're, they're depleted, Building out a fishery reef can make the problem per, uh, worse by concentrating fish in one spot and make them easier. What's fewer left are uh, becoming overfished and you make it easier to catch and you, you made the overfishing problem worse. So usually in our fish reefs, the idea if you, it's habitat limiting. So if you double the habitat, you have double the fish was the idea. But if you're overfishing, that's not the case. You're actually limited by how much reproduction the female fish can produce, how many eggs are being produced, limits the population, not habitat. And here's some of the lessons learned, some of the, between the traction production, what factors influence it for production. If there's low availability of reefs, then it's all production. There's no reefs there. But if you have a lot of reefs around, it's very, uh, mostly attraction. So you can see fish intensity, population controls, whether habitat, recruitment limiting. Fish that are obligatory reef fish would more likely be produced on it versus those that are partial or opportunistic like barracuda or jack or amberjack. And their behavior, whether territory, site attached or demersal versus ranging, home ranging midwater or uh, uh, surface type uh, fish. So those are some of the rules. This one little more science is a big project. Bill, um, Bill Lindbergh outdid me a few years later, or actually about the same time. He did a much bigger network. We built these reefs off Miami using structures through Sea Grant funding. And we laid them in a matrix, uh, randomized um, with one, zero, two modules, four modules, or eight modules. We doubled the modules. And we learned that uh, the target species, least off of Miami, were selling elsewhere and colonizing in the young adults or juveniles. So it was not really producing new fish. This is really attraction, but there's plenty of reef habitat around. By the way, in that cartoon, they're about 100, 100 meters apart. They're not all that big. In the, in the, they were really quite far apart. In the bottom is the summary of what happens. On the right screen there is the number of individuals. If you take a, how many fish on one module, if you put two modules, you get twice as many, and that's the predicted line. And what we observe is much less. Small reefs had disproportionately more, but smaller fish per module, so we added modules. And it turns out though, that the, on the other screen is the biomass. It's a log function of the, the amount of, the, the biomass, the log function of a no, number of modules. And that's a linear mod, you know, factor. So essentially larger reefs had fewer, but bigger fish. And finally, uh, just to summarize, uh, kind of a re reality check, you can't always believe your lies. Uh, so just generally, you know, we, conclusions are in those times that well-designed reefs can be a benefit. Uh, it'd be best if they're used in a comprehensive integrated ecosystem management type uh, context of all fishery tools. And of course, artificial reefs comes its own tool itself. And there's all kinds of science interest in that as alone as a tool, but it's best used in combination with fishery management and other things, being reserves, other approaches to conserve things. It's not a map panacea for overfishing. Uh, you need to have realistic goals and expectations of these programs. Uh, and beware of distracting things that are like public relations, media outreach, uh, waste disposal, tax write-offs, uh, make sure they're okay and not damaging to the environment. And, um, and really artificial reef effectiveness depends on understanding the target animals we're looking at, their biology and ecology. And the four critical factors for reef success or reef design, the material composition should last at least 50 years, we figure. Uh, the location is critical and depth. 
And for the future, um, the next generation gets to figure out what we're going to do with all the people. When I first moved to Miami in 1962, there were 5 million people in the entire state of Florida, a little cartoon on the right there. And right now, there are about 121 million, over 21 and a half million or so people in the state of Florida, and it's growing by 1,000 people a day. That's the challenge. And uh, how are we going to deal with that is going to demand a lot of attention and is the real issue uh, for our fisheries management. And with that, I will conclude. I'll show you one last picture of an artificial reef uh, taken by my colleague, Don, our good friend Don De Maria in the, in the Florida Keys of a bunch of Goliath grouper out of wreck out of, um, off um, Key West. So with that, I conclude. Okay, thank you Hayward and, and Jim. Really appreciate it. If we can get Hayward and, uh, and Jim going, yeah, go ahead, turn your videos on, turn your mics on. This is, we're now entering the uh, Q&A, the first Q&A session of the 2020 Virtual Artificial Reef, Artificial Reef Summit. Summit. And as a reminder, we are recording this. So uh, please um, you know, be aware of that. And we are encouraging everyone to type your questions into the chat box, which if you toggle down, you can see that um, on the bottom of your screen. So uh, we have until uh, so, uh, allocated until allocated 10 o'clock this morning to take questions. And then we will uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. If the questions wanna continue on, we, we certainly can. But Anna is going to make sure to remind us to, uh, to, to let everyone know when we hit that 10 o'clock mark. Um, ask questions. And just quickly, I want to acknowledge that we, we recognize that there was a mysterious black box on the screen during the talks and we are trying to troubleshoot that. So it's not just on your end and thank you for those who reached out. Yes, thank, thank you for that. Um, so we'll start with, I've got a couple questions already and uh, I appreciate both of uh, your presentations. Um, can we expand it so just uh, uh, we see the four of us on the screen, Anna? Is that is that possible? I hope everyone's seeing more, you know, just the four of us instead of all these little squares. I think um, if you go to your settings in the upper right corner and choose gallery view, you should see all four of us. Keith, myself, Hayward, and Jim in the tiles. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so I'll start with... Uh, with with Hayward with your with your presentation, you know as I as I look at uh, you know think about the kind of the early days of of artificial reef development, um, and I still do see this uh, sometime you know today um, you know it's a it's a persistent uh, issue, but I, but I, but clearly it was more of an issue you know back in the early days, and that that is you know um, uh, these folks that are approaching us state you know artificial reef managers because they. They, they have a disposal problem and they have material that they that they you know want to get rid of and 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 and, and refit so um so so Hayward you know thinking back to, to your early days you know how how much of a of an issue was that back then and uh and 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 how is how is how was that dealt with and uh and vetted when we first started particularly we had a lot of people who want to drop off white goods and we found out very quickly they didn't uh, so basically we had to go ahead, in many cases, just simply limit. And there were several, several times when people offered material to us that they wanted to get rid of, and we simply had to turn them down. Said, no, those things are really, you know, can go in the incinerator or the landfill, but uh, we had to be discriminatory after that. First of all, we said, hey, bring it in and we'll try it. But like we said earlier, trial and error, uh, we hated to turn down some of the things, but in many cases, they just weren't, uh, they were going to give us more problems down the road there. And so uh, once we got to the, and there it is now, all these tires, you know, they all go in the incinerator and generate electricity, but they just don't go out in the reefs at all. Bad move. But we did find that, uh, that we kept thinking, you know, there should be some limit. Bigger reef, to get more fish. So far, with Pinellas County, we have not found a, uh, you know, an idea of too many reefs. But another thing, important thing to point out, I didn't point out earlier, is right now, you got a bare sand bottle. Okay, you put something solid on it, right away then, you have algae attacking. That's basically primary production. And these are not exotic, these are local algae there. On top of that, then you've got a large amount of filter feeder. 
those filter feeders are taking out plankton. Well, that plankton is now going into the food chain and going up the way to fish. If the plankton did not, uh, was not being fed upon, then they fall down the bottom and become detritus and sand all the food. So uh, just with primary production, but also the fact that the idea that we can have too many reefs, that just doesn't hold up. That was an idea we had a long time ago, and it's been disproved time and time again. Thank you, Hat Hayward. Um, so now I'll, uh, I, I've, I've changed my background so I can switch over to Jim. Jim, uh, we, we, were, we found the, uh, the pink dinosaur. Thanks to Jenna McNeil in Palm Beach County. She, she dug in the archives and uh, here it is uh, behind me. <laughs> so I thought I'd, I'd throw that on as kind of an addition. Yes, I, uh, I appreciate that. Thanks, I have that to my collection. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that one. That would have been a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 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 Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll put a question over, over to you. Um, you know, in uh, your presentation, obviously, uh, you know, included a lot of, uh, a lot of bad examples over the history of artificial reefs. But um, can, can you share with some of, uh, some of the, some of the good examples uh, that, that you've seen, uh, especially in the early days that kind of brought us, you know, brought, moved us forward? Yeah, well, well, actually, one of the better examples was using bridge rubble. Um, when they did the Seven Mile Bridge, they redid it, and um, they took the old material and put it offshore, and so it had high current. And you go there, you can even tell it's rubble. It looks just like a coral reef, so it's under ideal situations. And I think that's a good example. Like I say, there are many uses, you know, for artificial reefs. They're not just all for fisheries, but uh, certainly uh, that's one of the good examples. There's some good science done with artificial reefs, and uh, Dr. Lindbergh, I think, did one of the best jobs in Florida looking at the effects of scale and distribution. Um, and, and the other thing, I mean, the other thing is that uh, all these fill a function. Fort Lauderdale, all these ships, they're a big attraction uh, for tourism. So those met the function they were doing. Now, whether they're going to help fishing or not, that's another question, but certainly for divers, and uh, I think that's an important thing to remember is there, there are different purposes. Just make sure you do no harm to the habitat and don't drop your ships on each other or um, blow them up or uh, dropping on, on live habitat. Make sure the materials are going to stay put. Not uh, going around uh, tearing up corals, seagrass, or ending up on the beach. So those are the the, the lessons I had. Learned very quickly. You know, the, the bottom line is that you know it's, you know policy needs to follow science, and the science is some of these things aren't working. We need to know that the policy should uh, take that information into account. Okay. So uh, we'll take, we've got some questions coming in from, from the audience. So we, we have one here from uh, Leslie Haynes, who's the Lee County Artificial Reef Coordinator. And, uh, and she asks, so um, with all the lessons learned over the years on do's and don'ts with materials specifically, do you, uh, did you participate in discussions with permitting agencies are on incorporating those limitations. So let, let's start with Hayward uh, on that. And maybe that is more related to Hayward because you were more directly involved in the construction side of things. So Hayward, can you, uh, can you respond to that? Yeah, what we had to do there then, and again, after it was fairly soon after we started having problems with tires that the uh, permitting people and Corps of Engineers and the state said, hey, tires, the only time they allow tires for a short time, they allowed tires in concrete where they had a concrete slab with tires on. And then after that, they pretty much just banned white goods they ban the tires, and nowadays, state core, none of those are going to allow any tires anymore. And of course, we still got those two million uh, down off South Florida there then, that the only real answer to that is eventually just pick the darn things up and, you know, put them in a landfill or burn them. They just, <laughs> I'll admit, I love tires to start off. I thought it was a great idea back in the, uh, back in the, the 60s, but <laughs> we were wrong. <laughs> they belong in the incinerator, period. Actually, if I could interject for a quick second, Hayward, you, that's the perfect segue for another question that came into the chat from Victor. And it's actually, it's, he posed it to both gentlemen. And in your opinion, what would be a cost-effective approach to solve the impact of tire reefs in Florida? The only answer there is to get a bunch of, they've been doing that ever since then, but simply put a bunch of divers out there then, and the divers are happy to do it. It's always, you know, most scuba divers that I've, come in contact with, love doing some kind of public service. And really that's the only final answer is to get the darn thing out of the ocean. You should have never been there in the first place, but now we got to, got, to, got to solve the problem we started. 
all the way. So, um, so Jim, Jim, you mentioned the 1987 conference in Miami. Uh, th thinking back, uh, when when did critical mass for artificial reef, you know, uh, research really really get get off the ground? Well, I think that was a good in Florida. That was one of the kickoff things. After that, you know, there's a lot more interest, a lot of funding here. There's another conference, and I think uh, in California later, and it had really good attendance. But then since then, I don't think they've had quite the attendance or interest. So a lot of the science has been done and uh, being used. So, but uh, you know, that's my example there. You asked about permitting. I'll just say quickly that uh, I had extensive sessions with South Atlantic Fishery Management Council about our fisheries in the fishery context. They realized many agencies uh, sign off on permits. The, the U.S. Coast Guard is interested in making sure there's not a hazard to ships and that sort of thing. They have a say. Most of these are permitted by the Army Corps of Engineers. And, uh, and NIMS has just an advisory uh, role in this. So, uh, you know, there is some mismatch between uh, people looking at very specific things and the whole big picture. And that's not really done, I think, very well. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Anna, do you have a, a one from the chat box to throw out there? We do, we have one from Robert Turpin and asking about if proposed brief materials are properly screened for density, stability, cleanliness, et cetera, is the motivation of the source of those materials largely irrelevant? As long as they're good materials and they are stable on the bottom, then where they came from or what the reason for donating might, doesn't really matter. The main thing is habitat. I mean, like the real estate, they, you know, habitat, 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 as far as marine life is concerned. The more habitat, the more species. And so far, we've never found a, a, a maximum amount that's going to cause a problem. So, so this is Jim. I, I would say it, it depends. Florida, the programs are by the county level, and the county is the one that usually accepts it on their permit uh, materials. And so they may have different criteria and uh, every once in a while I still find someone wants to blow up a ship or something. But uh, I know, you know, they took some um, fiberglass tabletops uh, that someone, they had were manufactured wrong and they wanted to donate them, but they didn't work. Small boats didn't work either because uh, they, they tend to move around in the, in the, in the swell. So, uh, so it's hard to say. Uh, the master, like overall, though, for sites are the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Coast Guard on materials. You try to get hazardous materials off lead, uh, off ships, uh, micro mercury micro switches off the military ships, that sort of thing. But so it, it's still, it's kind of, um, you know, you know, actually Keith, <laughs> maybe you have a better answer for that than me. But so I think it depends. Well, for sharing that insight. Um, so uh, bouncing back to, uh, to Hayward, um, do, do you have a, a, a sense from, from Pinellas County, you know, how, how important are, uh, are divers uh, relative to anglers in the artificial reef um, development? And you know, are, are you seeing a, a growing, is there, is there a growing demand for, for a non-consumptive uh, you know, diving, um, artific artificial reefs for diving? Yeah, in Pinellas County, you know, for a while, when we first started, we had a little conflict between the divers and the hook and line fishermen. But what we started doing then was when we put our piles out, piles of cover, other materials, we spread them out far enough that then when the divers can be on one and the fish can be on another and not have any problem. Then on this most recent one, the Circle of Heroes, there I deliberately designed the statues and everything around it to not attract fish. It's kind of different for me. I've been working to increase fishing there then for the last 60 years. All of a sudden now I'm doing it the other way. I'm engineering one that will not attract fish. And the whole idea was then then have it from a moral. And so now, a lot of these dive charters, they'll go out for a charter and they'll do the first dive strictly for looking on the circle of heroes. Then they'll move over to one of the fishing reefs nearby on Veterans Reef and do their spear fishing, whatever it's going to do. So we've been real effective then at separating and have minimum conflict now. So mentioning those statues, what kind of maintenance is, uh, is necessary? You know, they seem compared to the other materials, they're certainly a lot more fragile 
And uh, so can you talk about some of the maintenance that you've, you've been dealing with on that? Surprisingly, I haven't had any problems at all. What I've done is I've got a, a series of swimming pool brushes, stainless steel brushes used to clean concrete on a swimming pool. I put them on a short stainless steel cable and got one on the corner of every one of the statues. So every time a dive group goes out there, a lot of them will just go ahead and grab a brush and scrub some of the algae off. But uh, for times that when divers haven't been out there a while, like a period of bad weather, then some of my statues look like creature from the Black Lagoon. They've got algae on them, but luckily it comes loose very quickly. And once we rub it off, then the fish go after it right away. So, so far we haven't had any, any damage or anything of sort. Anna, do we have a question from the chat box for Jim? Well, we've got a couple and one from Tyler asking to put your science fiction writer hats on. Given that it doesn't appear that we can't really have too many reefs, what would be an appropriate long-term outcome or vision for the state or a local program? Oh, that's a good question, Tyler. <laughs> uh, so my vision is that, you know, that we need really a comprehensive, holistic, integrated program of all tools we're using in the ocean and make sure they're working together, uh, uh, that the funds are appropriately used but we have to figure out how we're gonna deal with a growing population who would like to use our resources. Certainly encouraging non-extractive things are, are good because you can use them over and over again. Fisheries, I think, have limitations and people need to accept that. And I think we need better sources of funding to support our fisheries programs because I, I think with FWC, most money has come from fishing licenses, but all those divers are using them too. Maybe they should be contributing and most divers I know would be glad to contribute to things. And we'd be more imaginative in our fisheries instead of having a barge, which I, I find about as boring as uh, looking at my sidewalk, uh, you could actually create things like maybe a reconstruction of a plate fleet wreck with cannonballs and uh, cannons and anchors and uh, make photo opportunities and attract people, you know, put the boons out every year like uh, Mardi Gras, you know, get your uh, 19 and 19 or 2021 uh, doubloon. You have to find the sand, you know, you still look every once in a while and people go out and look for their doubloons so they aren't hurting anything. So there's lots of room for creativity, but, um, you know, the problem is we have limitations of what we can do. And uh, artificial reefs are a tool, but they aren't going to solve it by themselves, just adding more reefs. Um, and so we need to be more creative in what we do. And one of the things really important, I think, is the use of marine reserves, areas where we don't fish. It's hard to do with artificial reefs because they're usually supported by funds that require that you make the site known. And so recreational anglers can fish on it. Well, it may be good for the area to have some areas that you don't fish on, either natural habitat or use reefs to, um, you know, to compensate or mitigate the, the areas closed to fishing to make it easier for people to fish. So there's a lot of room for creativity, but I don't think people think this realize the scale of the problem, how many people are going to be here. We're already seeing problems and uh, it's just going to get worse unless we were very clever and creative. Great, thank you, Tim. Do we wanna give Hayward the opportunity and I just have to give a two minute warning everyone. And I want all the participants to know that Jim and Hayward's contact information can be found in Feedloop, but I've also pasted their emails into the chat box. Hayward? Yep, well, again, like I say, we just keep on building them. I don't see any leveling off or anything of that sort. The more food production in the ocean, the more fish you've got. Now, admittedly, Florida is growing all the time. And being a native Floridian, uh, we always kind of look at Yankee tourists like hemorrhoids. If they come down and go back, they're okay. If they come down to stay, it's a pain in the butt. But again, <laughs> maybe that's just a Floridian pun. <laughs> maybe a redneck idea, I don't know. Excellent. Keith, did you have a final wrap up question that? might be pretty simple to answer in our time that we have left. Um, I, th I think we've covered the, the high points. I, I guess I guess we could, you know, maybe um, a little fun, a fun way to end is uh, Hayward, you know, still to this day, we talk about the, uh, the Matthews hand test. So can you talk about uh, how that kind of emerged? And, and uh, that's a little fun pit of history, I think, for us. And what we were doing, we were trying to pick a firm sand bottom 
that the materials would not sink into. So I would actually take my hand there down when I was picking the new sights and push it down into the bottom. And if my hand went down past my wrist, then the bottom was too soft and we'd go somewhere else. So that's where they came to Matthew hand test. Somebody even <laughs> said that I cast my hand in plaster and send them one. I said, no, any hand will do just as well. <laughs> so that that uh, that still persists uh, today. So I thought that's a neat a neat piece of piece of history. Do we have anything else in the chat box, Anna? We had one final question from Mike Sipos, but this might be a conversation that might need to continue later or through feed loop. But Mike wants to know. Have you guys seen or recorded changes in fish assemblages or productivity of steel ships over time? He asked a multifaceted question and I'm, uh, I think it's gonna provoke a lot of really interesting conversation. I can give you a short answer. Uh, this is Jim, uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation for a while was uh, monitoring artificial reefs over time. So they have data and go to their site, it's reef, um, www.reef.org. And uh, I think in the archives there, they have where they've actually tried to they have programs where they go out at once a month and look at artificial reefs at specific sites and over the time. So uh, they have certainly done some of that and uh, the data are there. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I think this has been a fantastic look at the past 50 years. It is really phenomenal to think that just between the two of you have more than a century of, uh, of experience. So we greatly are, are honored to have you here and appreciate every, all of your contributions. Um, the next session will begin at 1015. That will be in a different Zoom link. So you'll need to go back into feed loop and then go to the next session. And that, that is going to provide the, the five-year update. So for that one, we're only gonna look back past to the past five years, and we're gonna hear from each of the regions around the, around the state of Florida. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to go back to Feed Loop and check for the link, and, and we'll see you at 1015 in the next uh, Zoom platform. Thank you so much, Hayward and Jim. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you, guys. As a reminder, this is starting the break, everyone. So this Zoom session will end. Please go back to Feed Loop to get the link for the next session, as well as visit the lobby for fun trivia and the opportunity to win prizes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so.